been a great uh, crowd, and we're excited that this is a topic that so many people wanted to hear about today. Um, we're quite excited about this partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, um, and today we're discussing ways to increase the production of mixed income housing in Nashville. We, like I said, we were overwhelmed and quite excited at the same time that there was so much interest in this topic, but I think everybody knows that it's important for us to um, discuss this today. Mixed income communities has um, a myriad of benefits from improving health and education outcomes to improving opportunities for the lives of all residents, no matter the income, race, or status in a community. As many of you all know, Reverend Bill Barnes was a longtime social justice advocate of both affordable housing and the deconcentration of poverty, um, and preached the idea of mixed income communities even before, well before we were here today. And so we want to honor his leg legacy today by talking about it, and we're excited that we have such a diverse crowd here today from developers to financial institutions um, to funders. Um, and so that's why it's important that you network um, even after this event to make sure that we can get some more mixed income development happening. So today we're here to listen, we're here to absorb and plan the next steps for increasing housing production throughout Davidson County. Um, we hope that it serves the needs of all Nashvilleians today and years to come. In May, our office released a report, and I hope that all of you have had a chance to look at it, and I'm sure you've seen the big numbers in the paper. And it basically said that Nashville had a deficit of 18,000 affordable <laughs> rental units from 2000 to 2015. Um, so in a 15-year span, we lost 18,000 affordable rental units. And if we're not thinking about mixed income development, that number could grow to 31,000 units by 2025. Um, and so it's important and critical that we're discussing this and we're figuring out ways to increase affordable housing development. Since 2015, um, both the mayor and Metro Council has increased the funding for the Barnes Housing Trust Fund to $25 million in just two years. Dedicated public properties for affordable and workforce mixed income housing, implemented an inclusionary housing policy, created a housing incentives pilot program, and we're beginning the process of $25 million in GEO bonds. So we're doing a lot here in Nashville. Um, including MDHA, who's working to redevelop all of their public housing developments to make them more mixed income um, with the development of Casey Homes. So we, Metro Nashville, this room full of developers, nonprofit organizations, government and quasi-government employees, funders and elected officials, that's make up this room. We can do so much more. It is not just the government thing, it's all of us that have to play a part in this. So, um, one way we can get started is through educating our colleagues and our neighbors on the importance of supporting mixed income communities um, and proposals as they come before Metro Council. As the mayor said in her report, we need more Yimbyism and less Nimbyism. We need more yes in our backyards. So with that being said, let me cover a few housekeeping items. We're recording this today to make sure that your colleagues can review it later. It'll be on YouTube, on Metro National Network's YouTube channel. Um, we also have a Twitter handle. Um, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods will actually be, will be doing some live tweeting using the hashtag HousingNash. Um, so make sure that if you have any burning questions or comments, feel free to um, use that hashtag. There will also be a question and answer period um, shortly after the presentation um, where you can ask questions. So feel free to write your questions down and be prepared for those questions after um, Jennifer Crawford takes us through a facilitation of questions. And so I'll get started and pass this on to our presenters today. Um, in your handout, you do have the bios of both Ann Carpenter and Renee Glover, so I won't read it to you, but just know that they have a wealth of information um, related to mixed income development. So today, our first presenter is Ann Carpenter, who is Senior Community and Economic Development Advisor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and will be followed by Renee Glover. So thank you so much.
Okay, thank you, Adrienne, and thanks everyone for being here this morning. Thanks to the mayor's office, to Morgan Mansa and Adrian Harris and uh, Emily Mitchell in the Atlanta Feds National <coughs> Branch for pulling this all together. Um, I do have to give the disclaimer that these comments are my own and not those of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. But that being said, we are going to have a discussion today about, first of all, some results of some work that Renee and I recently completed, a uh, report that came out earlier this year. And so I'll go through a little bit of the data and the methodology, and then I'll kick it off to Renee to go into more depth into some of these suggestions and recommendations that came out of the work. Uh, I will do a brief overview of the Federal Reserve System and the community affairs function because I tend to walk into rooms where people aren't as often as familiar with what we do and, and why we're concerned with this space of affordable housing. Uh, so in Atlanta, we're one of 12 regional banks. We cover the southeastern United States, so we have six states or parts of states. We actually only cover the eastern half of uh, Tennessee, but we do have a branch here in Nashville and a few others across our district. Um, I should also mention we have a new president who came on in June, Rafael Bostic. Uh, he has a background in housing, in particular housing finance, affordable housing issues, and it, he has a, a deep interest in this topic. So we're really energized to have his leadership at this point. Um, so the Federal Reserve System, um, just kind of as an overview, is responsible for, of course, setting monetary policy. Uh, you probably heard the results of the latest meeting to set short-term interest rates that was released yesterday. Um, we also are responsible for supervising and regulating our nation's financial institutions, along with our other regulating partners. And um, we are also, as part of our duties, responsible for regulating the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. So that is where the community affairs or community development function has grown from. Uh, so in the 1970s, to address redlining and discriminatory um, lending practices, each of the banks established its own community affairs function. And so. The mission hasn't changed much over time. It's really still to activate financial, human, and social capital in low and moderate income communities. And we cover, of course, the Southeast, so we're focused on, on communities in, in our geographic footprint. Um, but the activities that we do have changed a bit over the last 40 years that CRA has been enacted. And so we tend to do a little bit more kind of tracking um, issues, uh, building an evidence base around what's going on around our district in terms of data and reporting. And then we do a, a pretty substantial outreach function where we're pushing out the information, we're kind of resource brokers between folks who have the information um, or the technical expertise to help out our stakeholders, which tend to be nonprofits, local governments, uh, philanthropic organizations, and the lending institutions themselves. And we do focus on kind of four key areas of um, you know, technical expertise. One is housing and neighborhood revitalization, which I personally cover. We also look at workforce development, community development finance, and small business and entrepreneurship. So if you're interested in any of those other topics, uh, we can find more information on our website. So I'll launch into a little bit of data, especially uh, background data as to how we got into the situation we're in in terms of the affordability crisis in the United States. And these are national data, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Nashville case in particular. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a graph showing median household income over time and home ownership rates over time. So income in blue and home ownership, home ownership rate in green. And the big story here is that um, until the last couple of cycles of the census, incomes have been incredibly stagnant and even declining since the recession period and during the recovery. Um, the last two census periods we have seen just a few days ago, we heard some good news that median income had ticked up again. Um, in real dollars, we're still only at about 2007 levels of income. So that is still relatively stagnant um, long term. And um, what we've also seen is that when you break those income data down into uh, income segments of the population, the low income and medium income households haven't made the same gains as the upper income households. So we're still seeing uh, income inequality growing um, by many measures. Of course, the home ownership rate has been falling and continues to fall at a, a moderate pace um, even today. So. You know, from a peak of um, almost 70% at the, the height of the, the housing bubble, it's fallen to under 64%. And it really hasn't shown many signs of increasing, maybe plateauing, but 
Um, some models show that this could continue to decline even to 55, 50%. There's a number of different estimates out there. Um, so that's part of the story. And of course, homeownership is, um, there are several kind of background reasons for this, one being the foreclosure crisis, one being the income story, uh, one being a lower rate of household formation. So people are holding off creating new households, especially kind of young people. Um, and so that headship rate has remained low. So all of these have led to a, cr a crush or crunch of rental household, rental, rental supply of um, an increasing, um, increasing dollars of rental uh, properties um, and cost burden households, those paying more than 30% of their income on housing have been increasing. And so the chart on the right, what you see are lo the lowest income bracket renter households and the percentage of those that are considered cost burden. So these are folks, households that are paying more than 30% of their income on housing alone. And from 1960 to uh, 2014, the last available data we have, this has increased by over 20 percentage points. So an inc incredible increase. Um, and when you actually look at another statistic of extremely cost burden households or households paying more than 50% of their income on housing, the numbers are also quite high. So for example, off the top of my head, I know in Atlanta, it's about 75% of these low income households are paying more than 50% of their income on housing. That's a, that's a stunning number. That means that if you have an emergency, um, if you have kind of your day-to-day -day needs on health, education, food, other household expenditures, uh, you really just don't have those uh, just put that disposable <coughs> income to spend or even to save and get ahead. So a little bit of local data to add to the, the picture. Um, last year, we did another paper with another visiting scholar, Dan Immergluck, and we looked at the supply of low-cost rented housing. We actually looked at subsidized and unsubsidized units, and what we found from the period of 2010 to 2014, so a relatively short amount of time, the number of units that were renting for $750 per month declined. In all the cities we studied, there were eight total, but in particular, the numbers were high in terms of net losses in Atlanta, Jacksonville, and Nashville. And you can see Nashville had the largest net decline, almost 8,000 units in just those that four-year period. Um, and that is uh, $750 per month. That's roughly affordable to someone making just over minimum wage and working full-time. Um, the second chart on the right you see here is again the cost burden household, percentage of cost burden households, but for all renter households, not just the, the lowest income. And you can see here that 50% in Nashville, and even more than 50%, the majority of households in most cases pay more, or cost burden, or pay more than 30% of their income on housing. So with all that being known, Renee and I put our heads together and came up with an idea for a research study and a paper that could look deeply at why are we losing so many <coughs> units? How can we increase the production of units, and in particular, mixed income housing, not just 100% affordable, um, concentrated poverty conditions? And so we went about um, uh, creating this paper. And this is the URL. I think it was also in the invite, but um, there's a number of ways to find it through our website, through me, um, or through this URL. Um, so. As a, as, a, as a sort of project overview, to begin with, our research question was, how do we foster the production or increase the production of mixed income housing and mixed income communities in this current environment? And we recognize that uh, the costs of, of development are increasing, and I'll go through a few ways in which that's occurring. And the uh, available subsidies are reduced. And so you can see in the chart on the right-hand side, this is just federal discretionary spending on housing. Uh, which includes project-based uh, and tenant-based section eight, home, and, and public housing. And you can see that over time it has declined quite precipitously. Some of these data are actually projected out into 2018, 2020, and are probably optimistic numbers given um, the, the, these proposed budgets coming out of Washington right now. So we understand that from the federal level, funding is likely to decline. Um, so how we went about our study was interviewing, this was all qualitative, interviewing stakeholders, um, including for-profit and non-profit developers, local and state agency officials, um, and a few other kind of advocacy groups and national uh, experts. And, and we did this in Atlanta, in Jacksonville, and in Nashville, because as you saw previously, those were the cities that had the largest net declines in affordable rentals. 
Um, and I would like to underscore what Adrian said about the benefits of mixing with communities. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with these. Um, but just to begin with, this is uh, sort of an antidote to what we've, we've seen over time with the concentration of poverty and the myriad problems that that has caused. And um, you can see in the maps on the right, these are data from a report that a student did for the Federal Reserve last year, um, where, and Paul Jargowski has, has come up with similar, or actually he uh, produced the study that inspired this work, I should say. Um, he, they've been looking at census tracts with higher than 40% poverty rates, and while the number and the number of, of the population in those tracts has declined sort of in the 1990s, it started to increase once again. So we're seeing this unfortunate reconcentration of poverty and income segregation in the places that we live. And that's led to a lot of problems. And so what we know about mixed income communities, and we have great data on this, there's a lot of research reports uh, that have come out over, over decades that, um, that underscore this. Uh, that, that mixed income communities provide social capital to, to all residents, but in particular the low income residents. They have improved physical and mental health outcomes, those social determinants of health, uh, you know, where you live matters, your zip code matters, it can even have an impact on um, your life expectancy, <coughs> we've seen data on that recently. Uh, it results in, mixed income communities result in improved school performance, lower rates of crime, and you know, just because of the increase in disposable income with the, the higher income folks mixing in, you have more access to robust amenities and services, even a grocery store, you know, things that some of us may take for granted but are, are unlikely to occur in concentrated poverty conditions. All right, so I'll talk now about some of the results of, of the interview process that we did. And Renee, I think we'll talk more in depth about some of the recommendations, but I'll go through a few of those as well. Uh, we really heard, first of all, our question um, that we started with was, what are the most significant barriers and challenges to creating mixed income housing from your perspective in your market? And again, we talked to people in three markets, but I think every single person said number one on their list was the high cost of land. Um, and so this was, this was echoed across the board, and, um, and, and it's a very tricky kind of obstacle. I would say that if we re-ran this analysis from what I'm hearing more in their business context lately, uh, labor is increasingly a piece of this um, as well. And we did hear that and we acknowledged that in the report, but um, I think that this has become, maybe is outpacing the cost of land as a high cost for, for construction. Um, a second barrier was regulatory burden. Um, this took a number of forms. I mean, sometimes it's, it's environmental, sometimes it's, um, you know, other, other types of, of um, local regulations, but often it was local land use restrictions, uh, exclusionary zoning types of restrictions. So parking requirements, uh, building material requirements, and things of that nature that add to the cost of development. And then third, a lack of interagency coordination, which I think we'll talk a bit more about today, um, came up. And this is really acknowledging the fact that when you're doing a mixed income project, or really any subsidized housing, you are layering these different funding sources, and they tend to come with um, you know, different inspection cycles, different deadlines, and reporting requirements, and, and other types of reporting regimes that can make the, the project um, very complicated, it can add cost delays, and, and sometimes it's just prohibitive for, for the success of the project. So I'll, I'll now kind of launch into recommendations. So these are things we heard from some of the interviewees, often from more than one interviewee that um, helped to kind of counteract those major challenges and, and others that came out of the, of the, um, the interview process. And so to address the high cost of land, there were a few um, kind of critical high-level recommendations, the first being limiting those exclusionary land use regulations, which we talked about. And so you know, minimum lot size requirements, um, again, those parking requirements, things of that nature, um, really add to those pre-development costs. Um, the second one is implementing land banking, and, and so acquiring land this way, and if it's donated land, helping to clear title on it through the land banking process. Um, that's been used effectively in a number of cities. Um, and secondly, a community land trusts was another piece that, that others felt that, that could be effectively used. And, and this has been used, of course, we think of it as a single family affordability, durable affordability strategy, but 
um, particular places like Florida have begun to use this for multifamily projects as well very successfully. And then finally using donated land. Um, and I, I put this uh, report that just came out recently from Enterprise as an example of a document that really adds a, a lot of depth to that, uh, you know, some of the um, complications or, or some of the recommendations around using publicly available, publicly owned parcels for development. A few other recommended strategies, um, first of all, around reducing regulatory burden. Uh, many people pointed to uh, allowing more flexibility in the use of funds. And uh, one program that was mentioned as a, as a model for this potentially is the Moving to Work pilot program um, that has allowed public housing agencies to, to use the data, to pool the, the money and, and use it in more flexible ways, and, and that's been successful in many instances. Another is around streamlining the application, reporting, and monitoring requirements, which will require you know, multi-agency coordination uh, at the state, local, and federal levels. Um, also, we, we talked to folks about increasing incentives, and so obviously we know with the resources dwindling at the federal level that we need to think about alternative sort resources, and, and one area that folks recommended was advocating for more state and, and federal um, tax credits. So LIHTC was seen as an extremely effective uh, tool in the toolbox, and increasing the uh, supply of LIHTC by two or three times could really um, to have quite an impact on the supply. Uh, a second uh, area of increasing incentives was really around creating dedicated state and local housing trust funds. And you, know, you all have a, a tremendous example in the Barnes Fund, um, and that was highlighted by folks outside of Tennessee as um, a, a great model for the local level. Uh, the state of Florida also has um, their document stamp tax, the Sadowski Act, and the ship and sale programs, which um, have been successful as well. So more of that, which you guys are already doing a fantastic job with. Um, other recommended strategies were around preserving affordable units, so understanding that uh, it could be more cost effective to take care of the units we have and to um, you know, renew those affordability commitments. And, um, and actually, this chart is showing um, the number of subsidized units with expiring affordability periods over the next 10 years. This doesn't mean they will all be lost to market rate, but uh, this amounts to over 7,000 units in just Nashville. I think it's just the city of Nashville alone over this 10-year uh, period. So add that to those 7,000 units lost in the last four years. You know, you're seeing incredible losses of units, um, both the naturally occurring and the subsidized units. Uh, so clearly we need to incent owners to renew these affordability commitments, possibly with tax, property tax breaks um, or other um, incentives, and also to set aside dedicated funds um, from the, the housing task fund or, or other uh, resources to prevent that kind of competition with new development. Uh, a couple of more strategies, one was around building political support, uh, both from the ground up, so from the public at large, to the elected officials, to the business community. Uh, we do know that NIMBYism is out there, and um, definitely there, there needs to be uh, strategies in place to combat that. And so you know, one way with the business community is framing this as an economic advantage and um, for prospective employers who might be relocating, for employers who are already here, they understand that workforce housing is needed and, and um, could potentially have an impact on their business. So that's that's one area. Another is just kind of improving the messaging um, and make room, the make room campaign has been embraced. In, in some cities, I'm not sure how if it's been used here, but for example, in New Orleans, they're, they're having events around make room and, and that's been pretty successful. And, um, getting the word out there about the challenges of low-income renter households, and all renter households, actually. Uh, and then another set of strategies was around improving coordination with other sectors. So I already talked about streamlining those different sources of funding and the administrators of the funding sources. Um, but there's other areas, too, where coordination could be really beneficial and, and could kind of help to create more holistic communities, uh, mixed income communities, uh, with paths to self-sufficiency. And so, um, you know, first, of course, it's utilizing the available land that the partners from the transit agency or the public school district have, have available. 
And then second, it's coordinating programming. So in a mixed income community, this is kind of bringing those quality of life services to bear um, in the, the community itself. So education, early education, workforce training, um, access to transit to kind of provide more economic opportunities um, and, and provide that sort of path to self-sufficiency. Um, I'll wrap up with a couple of moonshot ideas, and these were, uh, we asked people for their kind of most audacious, bold, uh, out of the box um, ideas, and not unexpectedly, a lot of folks came up with just shrinking the footprint of the unit, so micro units, tiny housing, um, this, is, this is sort of trendy, but if, if you know, obviously the costs are lower and, and there's an appetite for it, so it should be uh, definitely examined. Um, there was uh, a recommendation to engage university researchers and other thought leaders, um, either through kind of charrettes or studio projects with students or hosting competitions to, to kind of bring new ideas into the fold. And then, of course, um, working with more modest materials came up as well. So wood framing versus um, brick on three sides, prefabricated materials that are fabricated off-site and, and brought um, to the project. Uh, those kinds of things can also lower costs quite a bit. All right, so this is a summary table that's in the paper, so I'm not going to read it. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that there, these aren't all the recommendations from the report. I kind of highlighted a few things that, um, especially that directly related to those three major challenges, but we do have um, this kind of nice streamlined table for your uh, resource and um, it is found in the paper. So again, that's the URL, that's my email, and thank you very much for your attention. Well, good morning. Good morning. First of all, before I get started, I wanted to say uh, thanks to Ann Carpenter and uh, Todd Green at the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. It has just been a joy to be serving as a visiting scholar. And the only thing that my friends and colleagues will often ask is, are you sure that's scholar? <laughs> but in any event, I, I'm, I'm kidding a bit because I, my career has really been more on the active side of the business in terms of doing uh, the development work. Uh, I headed the Atlanta Housing Authority for 19 years where we piloted with a couple of um, private developers who you probably know, uh, Eckbert Perry at the Integral Group and uh, Richard Farron at McCormick Farron, and we created the model that was embraced by uh, uh, the regulatory, financial, and legal model to create uh, mixed-use, mixed-income communities. And with that said, I also have to quickly add that any comments that I make today uh, should not be attributable to the Federal Reserve, because at least Anne is disciplined and trained, but I might stray off. <laughs> so forgive me if I get off message. But, and I also want to thank uh, all of the officials who participated in the survey, because this is really important work. And uh, so we need you for this to work. And I'll just make an observation that you should be very proud of where you are in Nashville because Nashville is a desired address. It is a destination city. And so you really should be very proud of the work that you're doing. But we all know it's about coming together. So a couple of general observations before I get into some of the recommendations. Um, to zoom out, really what we are doing is we are all asked to do uh, community building work, even if you're doing it at the nation building level. But typically, the work is done a community at a time. And when community building work is done, it always occurs in the context. And so if you think about uh, where we are today, we are in the era of post-civil rights. So here we are all sitting here together uh, with the same challenges and issues in mind, but we're working it together across racial income class lines, and we're thinking, what's in the best interest of Nashville? So I want to 
just underscore that what we're working on together is building what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. always described as the beloved community. And the beloved community, quite frankly, is a community where regardless of race, class, income, um, sexual orientation, ethnicity, uh, everyone in the equation thrives. And so I think about two measures, and as you do your work, I hope you will keep these in mind. Is the community thriving? Is it resilient? And is it creating more opportunity? And similarly, at the same time, are the people also thriving, and are they more resilient and also sustainable? And similarly, with the cities, are they sustainable? It's interesting, bad policy is very costly. And so a lot of the work that we're doing today in terms of creating mixed-use, mixed-income communities, it should not be as hard as it is, but it is hard and it is, it is expensive because when you're making up for bad uh, mistakes of the past just because we didn't know better, and maybe we knew better, but we just had to make that accommodation. So a lot of these things that we are overcoming are the legacies of Jim Crow. So if you think about NIMBYism and those types of things, those are still holdovers from that legacy. So we all know that having economically integrated communities are more vibrant, more sustainable, and so the question is, how do we come together as a community to figure out how to pay for it? Because I will say this, staying with the old model is so costly that we can't even calculate the cost. There's always been discussion in uh, housing circles. What is the cost of doing nothing? What, what's, that, what's that price tag? And I will tell you that any number that we come up with in terms of overcoming some of the issues in creating mixed income communities, the cost of doing nothing is extraordinarily expensive. Because everything that we do, you know, you hear often the statement, well, we don't want the zip code to be the predictor of future outcomes. Well, unfortunately, where we are, we are in the middle of that conversation today because, quite frankly, too many times zip codes are the predictor of outcomes. And we have to think in cross-sector uh, ways because we need to look at affordable housing as being uh, just a symptom in terms of its uh, cost because what we've done by having bad policy in place for as long as we had, we haven't done real well in terms of educating our people and preparing people to be resilient and competitive. And so if you put it in today's context, all of a sudden, we are in a globally competitive world. So we're not just competing for talent with the folks in our own communities, we have people coming across the world with ideas, new technology, new approaches, new innovation. And so to the extent that we have any part of our population sidelined because they're sitting in bad educational arrangements and that type of thing, we're losing out because I promise you this, we have a lot of untapped talent in all of our communities. So the question is, how are we gonna get into the game and have everyone engaged? And so if you think about the importance of creating fixed income communities, it's really about tapping into the value of underutilized or badly used real estate and the untapped talent in the human beings to the sideline just because as we move along our journey, we haven't gotten there. So I would admonish you, don't get frustrated, just recognize that we're on this journey, 
be honest about where we are on the journey and see if we can't overcome some of the traps that uh, the journey has taken us into because of a whole host of reasons. So here we are today, and post-civil rights era, if you think about the subsidized housing program, it was initiated in 1937. But we are in 2017. So the fact that we're still trying to make some of those regulations and programs and approaches work in today's environment, we really need to slap ourselves a couple of times and say, guess what? Things have changed, evolved, and so how can we be smarter today about what it is that we want to get accomplished? And so indeed, some of the thinking in terms of creating mixed income communities, that's just what we need to be doing. We need to let go of the old way. Interestingly enough, when it was envisioned in 1937, it was solving a completely different problem at that time. And the problem at that time was uh, there were no environmental standards, there were outdoor toilets, uh, people were living in um, wooden shanties, if not on the street. And so when President Roosevelt was um, engaged about this issue, he said, great, we're in, coming out of the Depression, and so we need a jobs program, and we also need to get people out of these dreadful conditions. And that was great, and then other priorities came about, things changed, but here we are today. So let's think about it in today's context. So let's look at a couple of the challenges today as we contemplate these issues, because I will tell you, if we can come together and build consensus about the importance of building mixed income communities, the cost issues can be overcome, because some of the cost is overcoming the resistance to embracing a new way of doing the work. So uh, I was at a conference just uh, earlier this week, and uh, Secretary uh, Henry Cisneros, who I absolutely adore, just a brilliant guy, and he did so much uh, in the area of evolving our country, uh, he mentioned an article in the New York Times. And so this whole issue of income inequality is a real issue. And it's such a real issue that if you think about where we are in tackling doing whatever we do, we've got to figure out how we can get the incomes up of the families who are consuming these goods. We are a consumer-based economy. And if the consumers don't have enough money to buy the things that are being produced, we're going to have a problem. And so if you think about it from both a supply side and a demand side, the question is, how do we close this gap? And the name of the article, and I'll mention it very quickly, is Why the Pain Persists as it Comes Rise. And the simple thesis uh, in the uh, paper was that the stagnation of median income for men and women can be traced back to policies directly to education and family. And in today's economy, you have to have better skills and more knowledge to earn sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year than in the past. <laughs> And they took a look at what the uh, inflation-adjusted median uh, income of men working full-time in 1973 was $54,000. In 2016, it was $51,000, uh, roughly $2,400 lower. So what that means is that in the new economy, we've got to be thinking about how we bring our people along more quickly and so they can get into the game and be competitive uh, as we continue to evolve. Because evolution is going to occur. The question is, who's going to be at the table to cause that to happen? So second thing 
is that the housing that we live in, the zip codes that we live in, matter, environment matters. We talk about communities of opportunity. And that's what we're doing together as we build these communities, which is also why we have to do it from a cross-sector approach, because we need to have great housing that is safe, that has access to great schools, because even if we can't get anything else right, if we can get ourselves educated, and I'm not talking about being able to uh, you know, see Jane run, see Dick run, you remember those old, old lines? Hopefully we can do that. But we're now into the age of technology. And innovation is occurring at such a fast pace. The question is, can we, working together, create great schools by having great neighborhoods that can actually keep us in the game? So, um, one of the things that you folks have done here in Nashville, which is really fascinating, is uh, you've adopted a form-based code. And that's really so progressive because a lot of cities are looking at that because, quite frankly, how you create places and, you know, anybody who uh, is in the real estate development business, you know, they want to talk about creating great places. Well, this code, does a lot to celebrate the things, the lessons learned and best practices, and it also helps with the creation of affordable housing because one of the recommendations is how you can use density bonuses and height bonuses to create incentives for private developers to do additional units and hopefully get that cost down. But in addition to that, regardless of race, class, culture, and those types of things, if you use these codes to create great places like walkability, green spaces, leveraging the investment in uh, public infrastructure, maybe leveraging uh, parking, you know, too much of our land, you know, we talk about a scarcity of land. I know in Atlanta, we had thousands of acres of parking spaces they quite frankly weren't adding to either the environment or to the supply of housing that was needed. Actually, it's not a bad land banking strategy, but if you think about that, you've got to move it out of the parking uh, column and put it to work. But uh, this form-based code is really a good idea, so if you're not familiar with it, you know, learn more about it because the types of thinking that go into it it's really tremendous it's how the buildings relate to the street, uh, sidewalks, biking paths, green space, all the kind of smart things that I know all of you folks, I understand many of you are real estate developers, you already know, but the leverage for creating additional affordable housing is also a very interesting uh, idea and one that I think whose time has come. Um, we also talked about harmonizing the regulatory framework. So let me tell you how we get into trouble with the kind of regulatory schemes we have. Unfortunately, uh, either the state legislature or the uh, Congress, they read the newspaper, they consume it with passion, and they see a bad thing occurring, and the typical reaction is to create a new regulation to address that issue. And so what we've got to do is come together as a community and say, we are prepared to buy into the best practice. One, one of the things that we did in Atlanta is we said, well, particularly for affordable housing, and Ann talked about it, there can be sometimes seven or eight uh, types of financing tools used to get the cost down so it's affordable. But unfortunately, each one of these regimes has their own uh, application. Uh, they actually have what slices of the income band they'll serve. They also have different uh, inspection regimes and on and on, and it just goes on and on and on. So what we uh, approached uh, heard about 
is well, what would happen if we looked at the uh, regime used by the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is a very highly regarded program, uh, and said, since we're all trying to get at the same thing, could we indeed align the whole scheme with that type of approach? And could we use the inspection protocol? Could we do reliance uh, letters and that type of thing? So really, just getting in the room together and sticking with it long enough to work through it. So um, that process has started. It hasn't gotten completely signed <coughs> off because one of the issues that comes up is, you know, we have this little thing called the election cycle. So, you know, every four years, you know, you possibly have new players coming in and new ideas and this, that, and the other. But I think this can be driven by the development community and local government to say, you know what, we are prepared to work in collaboration to get to a point where in this era, of declining resources, can we get greater relief recognizing that we'd have to agree on the principles, LES, of what needs to happen because we can't compromise the intended outcomes, solutions, and so on and so forth. And I think that has some legs, and I think we can work on it and perhaps get it done. Um, we spent a lot of money on um, addressing the fact that we had environmental uh, issues at so many sites. And it's not surprising because the environmental codes just came in really about 40 years ago. So if you think about land that was developed uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s in some cases, there were no environmental standards. So in some cases, you know, you have uh, properties developed on polluted land or some manufacturing uses just uh, created a lot of bad stuff, soil, uh, contamination, and this, that, and the other that also leached and so on and so forth. So as we use public dollars to remediate those lands and put the land to new uses. So for example, we had an old steel mill. You probably have heard about the project in Atlanta called Atlantic Station. If the government is going to put resources in to clean it up, then there should be some requirements that there be some affordable housing. Because once we have, as a community, and I'm really, talking to the private real estate developers in particular, if we say, you know what, having mixed income communities makes sense because we can't afford to do it any other way, then I think we'd have a proposition where uh, the local authorities don't feel they're pushing uphill. Because what I have seen too often is that the local government, even though it wants to do the mixed income communities, they are concerned about the pushback and the resistance that will come back from the private development community. And you know how it goes. So you run and you see your favorite state legislator and say, well, you know, you're trying to get me to do this and this and this, and it's really terrible and this, that, and the other. And so what happens is these things don't get off the ground as quickly. But if we could come together as a community, we can actually make that happen because it makes good business sense and it makes good uh, community building sense. And I promise you this, the more people we get in the game, the more productive we are as citizens, the pie should grow rather than shrink. We are not in a zero-sum game. We are in a zero-sum game mentality, thinking that because of our lack of innovation and creativity, the pie can only be this size, when quite frankly, if we tap into all of the God-given talent of each of you and everybody in our city or in the world, the pie could be endless. So 
it's important to think about these things, but there are a number of ways that land can be freed up, and it's being freed up daily by investment. But as those investments get made, we need to be thinking, I want to build communities like I build a company. So in a company, you have senior management, you have middle management, and you have employed just the workers. So since we don't have all the resources in the world, why should any one of those groups be coming in from the suburbs, or the exurbs, or wherever, to get to a job when if we were thoughtful and built that community, we actually could have enlivened communities that leverage form-based codes, building great communities, and actually get better outcomes because when you analyze each one of the sectors where we have struggled with this issue, it's because we have built communities not for everyone, but for different classes. And if we can overcome that, we will see better outcomes in schools and so on and so forth. So we'll go into a little bit more depth during the Q&A, but I want to leave you with two thoughts. The issue of our time right now is ending social injustice. And what do I mean by that? Eliminating those zip codes that are leading to, be, to, to bad outcomes. And those things can only be addressed as we, if we, the citizens, buy into the notion that everyone has the right to tap into their own God-given human potential and make a contribution <coughs> to make the world a better and stronger and more resilient place. And that is really left up to us because if we change our thinking about this, and you can say strictly in a business conversation because what you should be thinking about is cost avoidance for bad policy and bad approaches. Now that we know, you know, I think uh, it was Maya Angelou who said, when you know better, you do better. And then as we approach our work, we need to be thinking not that this is a zero-sum game, but that if everyone gets engaged and if we can bring better policy and better thinking to everything that we do, that the pie will be bigger, better, and everyone can thrive and everybody can be part of this great American dream. This is indeed the strongest country in the world and it's up to us to go to the next level because we've been through those journeys. We have been there and we're not going back. So let's figure out, since we're going to continue to progress, let's bring our progressive, creative, innovative approaches and thoughts to building community. And I know that each of you can do it. And hopefully, this has been helpful to stimulate some thinking and some great questions. And I'm going to take my seat. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Carlett, and I'm the Vice President of Metropolitan Policy at the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. And I wanted to thank Adrian for um, allowing me to be part of today's program and help with moderating um, the Q&A portion. Um, for those of you that haven't taken a chance to, or the time to read it yet, um, the report that Renee and Anne and their colleagues wrote, what a tremendous gift to our city, to be specific to our city, to talk to folks in our community that are working on these issues and then give us city-specific recommendations. Not everybody gets that. And so I really encourage you to go back and read the report. And I would recommend that you read it in tandem with the work that Adrian and Morgan Mansa and others did in the Mayor's Office of Housing on um, the Housing Nashville report, which is just terrific in looking at supply and demand and the gap very specific to census tracts, specific to um, area 
um, median income. It, it, it's just tremendous how helpful this is and in laying out the tools that we have and where we need to be headed next. Um, what a great resource. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, you may be wondering now, wh why would the chamber be um, up here and, and talking about this issue? And um, I can tell you that in a nutshell, our projections show that over the next five years, our region will have between 120 and 140,000 folks in our region retiring. And so we are very focused on workforce. Um, my executive director, um, Ralph Schultz, talks about how in the past, economic development was about wooing the company to come to a region. And that's still at play. But a lot of times these days, that company will not give you the time of day if they don't believe that you have the workforce. And what draws workforce to our region and what makes this a place where, where they can stay are things like affordable housing and transit and quality of life issues. Um, and we have an annual survey of our members, and they are starting to say, housing, finding housing that is affordable to my employees is a challenge. And we are starting to hear from them um, anecdotally, I'm concerned about will I be able to get the workforce that I need. And so in our work at the chamber, everything from our work in the high schools to um, reconnect, which is um, sending folks who have some college or never went to college, non-traditional students back to college, our work in sensible justice reform, our work in transit, and as a member of the Transit for Nashville Coalition, um, and our work on affordable housing, it's all around our interest in workforce. Um, and so that's why we're interested and happy to be here today. We definitely see um, affordable and workforce housing as an economic advantage to our region and something that we have to um, protect. And so I'm going to start with a couple starter questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so the Federal Reserve Bank's report cited the cost of land as a significant barrier to uh, building affordable and workforce housing. And we know the increase in the cost of land in our region is breathtaking. Um, one solution offered by the report is land banking. And I was hoping that Adrian could give us a recap on what Metro is doing in that um, arena right now. And then maybe Renee and Ann could speak to any creative solutions or new strategies that you've seen um, in your work. Sure. Um, I think many of you know that we've donated several properties, over 40 properties, to nonprofit organizations for single family and rental development through the Barnes Housing Trust Fund, but also any of the other larger metro properties that have kind of come through um, also have had a requirement of affordable and workforce housing. So 12th of Ledgewood is an example. Um, we haven't broken ground yet, but we are in, um, in the midst of developing that site. That is one property that had not been developed ever for housing development, and we decided that that might be the best way to make sure that we had mixed income community because there was um, Edgehill Homes on one end and then the other end is 12 South. Um, so we decided to do workforce housing at that site to make it a holistic and mixed income community. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, as we go forward with thinking about Metro-owned property, we're certainly thinking about doing that. I think you all know that MDHA is um, investing a lot of time and effort into redeveloping public housing developments as we know them today, which are slated to be mixed income. So I, I think we're having a lot of these conversations and we are headed in the right direction. Okay. This is fine. It's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I would say um, uh, you know the thing that I one of the things that I highlighted in my slides was the use of donated land, um, and I think that that is uh, I know Atlanta is taking a deep look at that and, and doing kind of a, an audit of what lands out there and what it would take to remediate and redevelop it. Uh, I also understand there are a lot of challenges around that, including clouded title issues, remediation issues. Um, so, you know, there's caveats there. Um, one other program I would mention is in Florida, they have a pre development loan program, which has been really successful. And I believe it's $750,000. Um, that they, they finance at 1% uh, for acquisition, remediation, and a number of other activities. So, um, you know, a program like that, I think, and that's the Florida Housing um, Finance Corporation that um, administers that program. 
uh, is also something to consider. I think it's been really successful for, for um, you know, meeting that gap in the initial pre-development phase. Yeah, I was going to suggest uh, it was our experience as we were redeveloping the public housing um, that was located throughout the city that often it would be about a mile if you drew a concentric circle around the site that the property values because of the disinvestment and the bad outcomes that were uh, happening as a result of concentrating families in poverty uh, it would be a very smart idea for the city or other, if you have a land bank in place, to assemble those parcels before the values uh, are driven by the speculators who are going to come into town. And that way you can plan what's going to happen around those sites as they're coming back. So, so that's one strategy. Uh, clearly the Brownsville programs uh, as you're uh, taking uh, land that was in a bad use, bad being that's no longer uh, generating any resources and it, it was also polluting, uh, as you clean them up and as you make the investments uh, to work through what's the appropriate uh, percentage uh, of affordable housing. And uh, there's going to be this infrastructure fund. Nobody knows what it's going to be uh, designed to do. But it would be smart that any time you see any type of federal dollars or state dollars or local dollars going into the site to just build into the program uh, having some affordable units. So I think there's a lot of ways of being creative. And uh, we need to be leveraging uh, other investments like in the public infrastructure. So if new water and sewer systems are being put in or whatever, uh, we need to be thinking about creating a healthy community and a healthy community design has got to have housing for the senior executives, the middle management, and, and the workers because uh, it will present uh, a competitive advantage uh, if you're thinking that way. You know, the report cited exclusionary housing policies and, and zoning as a barrier to building affordable housing. And I think at the core of this is um, another challenge discussed in the report, NIMBYism and the fear of change. And as the conversation about mixed income housing um, begins in earnest in Nashville, I think you'll hear people say, and some people in this audience may be thinking, will people of different socioeconomic status uh, want to live near one another? And we're about to undertake in the Envision Casey and, and other Envision processes some really um, grand scale work on this. And so I was hoping that Renee or Anne could address this kind of elephant in the room. Um, I know this has to have come up in other communities. What actions have developers or elected officials or community leaders taken to demonstrate how mixed income housing works to the skeptical? Well, I know Renee has a lot to say about that, so I'll go quickly first. Um, and I will say that I think the data really speaks for itself, um, and hopefully there are, are increasingly more true believers in the data. The research that's been done around um, these kind of natural experience, experiments where folks are moved from concentrated poverty conditions to mixed income housing conditions, um, the work of Raj Chetty, others um, have really shown, you know, the, these, the, basically why we need the argument for mixed income communities. So I would say putting more of the data out there, educating the public once again. Um, I think the Yimby campaign that the mayor has embraced is, is amazing. Um, I've seen that you know, in San Francisco, I think is where that movement came out of, and it's, it's been embraced on the West Coast, and to see it take its way over to Nashville is great. Um, and yeah, just engaging the community whenever possible in the you know pre-planning stages of a project throughout the entire uh, you know life cycle, just making sure that you have uh, community involvement and a community understands what the vision is and has that kind of shared value um, um, of a mixed income productive community. So when we got started with the work in uh, 1994. The most frequently asked question 
that we had when we were talking about the notion of creating a mixed income community was who's going to want to live next door to those people? And those people, unfortunately, were the proxy for black and brown and poor people. And so we had to actually engage in that conversation so that we could uh, get to the heart of the issue. And, and as it turned out, um, we overcame that issue. Uh, and today, mixed income communities is no longer a foreign notion. But there were two things that we did proactively to uh, make a difference. Uh, Anne mentioned it. We engage with the families. And it's about standard setting. And I think that one of the things that we do as a society is rather than solve problems, we run from them or we make accommodations. And some of the accommodations that we make are some of the worst things. Because quite frankly, uh, there's an expression, and I forget who the originator is, and I, I love expressions, so you'll hear me use these things. <coughs> but the bigotry of low expectations is the worst thing that we can do to society. Because I promise you, if everyone gave us low expectations, that would have been what we did and nothing else. And so to accommodate some of these bad policy decisions, oftentimes, coupled with it, are very low expectations. So working with the community, we actually raised our expectations. So things like having a work requirement, uh, that was bought into, having standards in terms of uh, behavior and screening. And guess what? If you lived in some of these areas, and maybe it isn't as bad here in Nashville as it was in Atlanta, but when we started to work in, in the 1990s, uh, Atlanta was the most violent city in America. It had the highest violent crime rate. And each of the public housing projects, because they had been left to their own devices and had been uh, eliminated from any standards, and they also became housing of last resort because the feds had pushed all of society's problems there, there were no standards and the people were suffering. And so when we started having the standards discussion, the first thing that was said is we want higher standards because we want a safe community for our families and our children. And so when the families left using the vouchers to relocate, there were two reasons that they left. Safety and a better educational opportunity for their kids. So this whole notion of universal humanity is absolutely right. People want the same things, and they want to be challenged, and they want the standards. So this notion of nympheism is an artificial creation by people making politically expedient uh, policy decisions and steps. So you can have great communities, and we have no resistance in any of the communities about people living side by side because they bought into the standards and everybody was there because they wanted a great community, they wanted a great school, and they wanted a great opportunity. All right, last question for me, and um, this is a surprise one because they answered the other one I had, had planned. So you all mentioned um, uh, the link and did between um, housing and transit. And then Renee just now mentioned trying to capitalize on big investments. And the biggest one that our city is thinking about right now is our transit investment. Um, the city and other partners lobbied at the state to be able to allow TIF in transit areas and for affordable housing. So we're amassing some tools. Can you all talk about um, mixed income housing and its relation to transit? It's, uh, kind of a window that we're very interested in seeing with a transit investment, how can we be talking about affordable housing as well? Okay, sure. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I'm 
I'm really heartened to hear that. I think that's amazing that the um, steps are in place to start uh, making that happen as, as a plan um, for Nashville. I would say I've done a little bit of work on this, on um, you know, kind of the spatial mismatch problem we tend to see in Atlanta in particular, which is one of the areas I've studied most closely. The job centers for low and moderate skilled workers are very distant from the affordable housing that they would be, they, they would really be able to afford. Um, and the transit system is lacking between those two areas. Um, I mean, we don't have, we have a 28 county region, only three of those counties have any transit at all, and it's very difficult and time consuming to get from you know, one of the more remote counties in the south to the north areas where there are job centers. So it's a tremendous problem, and when you add up that cost of housing plus transportation, um, you know, we looked at 30%, 50% as being cost burden, extremely cost burden. You're seeing people paying like 75% for those two things combined, and that's more average than just an outlier for a low-income household. Um, so that's not tenable. Um, but there is also research out there that concerns many of us um, around equitable TOD work in that when you build, especially light rail or, you know, fixed, fixed rail kind of transit systems, gentrification does tend to occur around those stations. Um, you're going to see commercial investment, you're going to see um, displacement, you're going to see, um, unfortunately, many times um, this involuntary displacement occurs. Um, so you have to be cognizant of that. Definitely the affordability component has to be strong, it has to be a, a, you know, a sizable proportion of the housing units. It has to have you know, a nice long commitment <laughs> associated with it. Um, because there's there's plenty of data coming out of cities like New York and San Francisco, but even um, you know smaller towns and, and um, smaller metros. So you know it's, it's a double-edged sword. I think equitable transit-oriented development is definitely necessary to get folks to those job centers and be able to afford um, you know a, a quality of life, affordable housing unit, and access to transit that helps them to get to those economic opportunities. But we do have to be cognizant of the gentrification um, component and how to counteract that. So very quickly, um, housing policy is education policy. Housing policy is transportation policy. Housing policy is health care policy. And that's why it is so important for us to get over this notion of uh, creating separate housing complexes around incomes because we just can't afford it. Um, but the hopeful thought in all of this is that millennials, and we're about to hand off the baton to millennials, who is the largest uh, segment other than us baby boomers who are you know, aging and hopefully if we don't completely mess ourselves up, we may have a few more years. Um, I think that the things that we were all focused on uh, and concerned about are actually going to go by the boards. And so I think that you know millennials want to be in town. They like hip places. They like walking, uh, transit. Very few millennials are investing in cars and, and those types of things. So I think you have a real opportunity. And it would be a huge missed opportunity if you didn't use uh, mixed income as one of the strategies as you do your uh, transit-oriented development. And um, I want to say a word about gentrification, not that you asked the question, but you know, that is the most abused word in the dictionary. <laughs> because it's almost like, well, if something nice is about to occur, uh, people who have less income can't afford to be there and enjoy the nice things. So hopefully the answer isn't, well, let's keep it uh, raggedy, broken down, dangerous, and underinvested. That can't possibly be the answer. So what that means is, again, we have to work on getting the people resiliency up and getting people's incomes up, and there are strategies and ways to do that. But we also have to look at those uh, persons, maybe elderly persons whose incomes are where they're going to be, and through some thoughtful policy, like tax relief, property tax relief, 
homestead, whatever, and there are things that have been done all around the country so that people can be there and enjoy what everybody, every single person wants, high quality of life, great amenities and opportunities, and it should be the requirement on the part of the policymakers to address those issues in thoughtful ways, and there are strategies to do it, um, but for God's sake, the answer is not, well, let's leave people in hell because that's what we can afford. That's the wrong answer. All right, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience now. Um, we've got a, a good bit of time for questions, so if you can raise your hand, and I'll call on you. We're going to do one question per person, and if you'll be succinct, then we can get through quite a few more. Um, and I'll repeat the question so we make sure we get it on our recording, and then we'll go through all the hands once, and we can head back if anybody has a follow-up question. Um, so let's start hearing from the audience. Who has a question that they want to raise? Yes. Good morning. Marshall Crawford with the Housing Fund. Ms. Glover, it is a pleasure. Uh, we appreciate all that you have done in the city of Atlanta and throughout the country. I just moved here from Atlanta, so I've been there and I admired your work and appreciate all you've done. And it's great seeing you again as well. You just talked about gentrification, and Mayor Kasim Reed put basically a moratorium on on the property taxes, not forcing individuals who have lived in their particular communities from being forced out because of the increase in, in property tax. Could you just speak a little bit more of that in trying to address that issue of gentrification? Well, I think the, uh, the short-term fix uh, was that he went to the foundation community and, and raised money. This is an area that you probably have read about called the West Side. In, uh, and, and, and it sits in the uh, shadow of our brand new $1.5 billion uh, football stadium, which I admit is very nice, <laughs> and it's very exciting, and uh, the Falcons do hope to go to the Super Bowl, if not this year, next year, so not, not that uh, you all don't have similar aspirations, <laughs> and you have a beautiful stadium as well. Uh, but part of the thought process is here's an area that has been underinvested un under for decades, and uh, it is an all it's also an area that uh, is a legacy of the Jim Crow era. And so the question is, now that there's focus on revitalizing that area, uh, what can happen in terms of property taxes? So short term. Uh, there was a fund of some $5 million just to help people pay their property taxes. Longer term, there are going to have to be some policies put in place because, again, there have been families there 40, 50 years, a lot of elderly uh, citizens who are no longer working, and so you don't want to see them forced out, so there's going to be some policy. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is a lot of work being done in the early childhood development arena, the education arena, the job training arena, uh, you know, community colleges are great assets. So getting people in the game so they can build their incomes. Uh, but that's what's in place. I think they're trying to increase the fund, but it's got to come back to the policymakers so that you don't have unintended consequences from uh, progress. Yes. Okay. So, uh, my name is Wardell Wright. Um, can we get the microphone? Thank you. Um, Wardell Wright and Nancy Haley Shelton. We just launched two um, nonprofits, Stone Street Housing Foundation and Park Avenue Career Services. And what you said about the people, building the human capital, the social capital, that's one thing we're concentrating on. We have classes that we have our tenants going through, and they're concentrating on three areas, which are um, home and health, arts and culture, and, and careers and finance, so job readiness. Do you have any programs that you've seen that work where you're educating the people inside the units to grow and get out of the units um, through any programs you've involved in? 
I, I will tell you the program that I probably love the most because of its effectiveness uh, is uh, we developed when we were moving thousands of families. Um, we recognized first families are not going to necessarily come to a place for services. Uh, and so when people are using the voucher, they're making choices and moving all around the metropolitan area. So we developed, uh, and the woman who created the program, Hope Bolden, uh, created a family-based coaching and counseling program for like a five to seven year period where the counselors who were specially trained, social workers, we weren't trying to help people be happy in their present state. <laughs> we were talking about moving the needle and this is all about building people resiliency and capacity so that folks could do their own thing. Uh, the coaching and counseling program was just phenomenal because first there's the trust building part, then there's building a family plan, and it's working with the entire family and doing situational problem solving. And um, I'll, I'll be happy to share with you uh, a couple of write-ups on the program, but for my money, uh, that was all about changing the mindset uh, because unfortunately, when people are in these desperate situations, you know, there's sort of a beat down that goes on and eventually people start seeing themselves as how they're being described, but people don't really know who they are as human beings. And so there's a period of time to get people back on track. But if I told you about the success stories and the kids on their way to the Ivy Leagues and all the colleges, and every single time those kids, when they would break out and do some things, they'd always say, I want to come back and reach another child who I can help come along. AHA program? Yeah, I thought you might mention purpose-built communities too, um, which is another model that uh, is more place-based, but um, if you're not familiar, purpose-built has, uh, yeah, exactly. it has a number of sites and, and they do, you know, the mixed income housing component, but also the early childhood education, physical activity, um, family self-sufficiency work. Um, that's been very successful as well. Yeah. I'm going to toss in one question that we got over Twitter. Um, we had a mixed income community for many years in the Edge Hill neighborhood until zoning changed and until the introduction of short-term rentals. Um, with those kind of features, how, how do you all propose to help neighborhoods like that that had been mixed income uh, survive as a mixed income community? So that's a single family neighborhood that's transitioned essentially? Yeah, I think it probably was primarily single family, yes. Okay. Well, I would say, I mean, as Renee mentioned with the property, tra property tax freezes or breaks, um, you know, that's one way to help folks stay, uh, you know, age in place and stay in their homes and prevent that involuntary displacement. Um, I mean, the short term rental, that's probably another policy issue for another policy discussion. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of others. Yeah, the, the other thing that we did in um, running our Section 8 program is that we imposed some uh, caps on how subsidy could be used in a single community because we didn't want to talk out of both sides of our mouth. So on the one hand, you can't say you're deconcentrating poverty and then pushing uh, the families into fragile neighborhoods. So I think it's a great opportunity, and I'm looking intentionally at Adrian. Uh, it's, it's a good opportunity for a policy discussion and policy change because what you don't want to do is um, work on both sides of the policy argument about, well, I'm taking care of this situation, but not being concerned about the other uh, impacts that occur. So it's got to be on a comprehensive and holistic approach so that you are uh, creating next year's and next decade's uh, problem. 
Um, Freddie had had his hand up for a minute. So I was going to ask a follow-up question. Yeah, I think I heard Ms. Glover uh, reference resilience at one point. I think this is maybe you know connected to what I was thinking about, right? Because we do have, yes, a form-based code. We've got, uh, but then on the periphery of downtown, we've got all these neighborhoods, which did probably have a mixed income fabric, uh, and now well-capitalized developers, I think there's a distinction between large projects which can be intentionally developed and then those where individual developers or small development groups can come in, absorb a number of parcels, and then quickly change the fabric of an existing community, right? So maybe maybe we do these policies and we, we take these strategies and they're kind of one time, but I'm interested in the stewardship, right? How do you build the resilience again so that uh, you know, a project that kind of has a basis in mixed income or economic inclusion maintains that over the long term. Well, clearly, the, the more of an economic mix you have in the communities is the long-term sustainability that is getting there. So uh, in terms of the stewardship, so I'll borrow something from the purpose-built uh, model that um, Anne referred to, and uh, what they call the secret sauce in their component is the community quarterback. And so it's a fairly large study area, and there are one or two uh, institutions or organizations that become the steward of that investment so that you don't want it to tip too far one way or the other. So you have to make sure that you're maintaining the mix over time because uh, the, the reality is you achieve your best outcomes when you have um, a fair amount of uh, disposable income that will attract the other investments um, and just try to uh, destroy a high-performing school uh, in, in a neighborhood. Has anybody ever tried to do that? You know, they go and say, well, you know, I really don't like the principal, or I don't like the teachers, and this, that, and the other. Well, I promise you, in uh, an economically integrated community, that conversation is going to be long, hard, and it's going to be thoughtful, and the result is that that school is not going to be destroyed if the parents have anything to do with it. So long term, it's the investors in that, investors being the neighbors, the people that live in the community who are the strongest uh, protectors, but sometimes if you can arrange for it, if you have an organization that is in fact the steward that would make sure, looking at the, the data and the numbers to make sure that things are continuing to move in the right direction, and that people are being intentional. You know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of reference to intentionality to make sure that the efforts and investment that were put in uh, are undone uh, unintentionally because, you know, some other priority comes along. Um. Um, first of all, uh, just a word of appreciation for the way in, a word of appreciation for the way in which you frame this conversation. Well, we've been at this for quite a while, but the way you put the pieces together in this framework of your presentation is very helpful, especially the relationship between income and housing. Um, a little concerned about the transportation um, issue. Um, and you discussed that briefly. Um, you know, we're all we all know what our needs are in transportation. The concern is the gentrification of the corridors, and whatever housing is built will go straight up, not conducive for families to raise kids. So we've been promoting out loud the need to provide affordable opportunities on, into the neighborhoods around corridors. And you talked about the intentionality of us needing to look at mixed income neighborhoods as we build our transportation plan. Wondering if you had any specific suggestions for our doing that other than the general ones you mentioned. Well, the, the only thing that comes to mind immediately, and I have to give it some thought, is um, 
as you're framing out your um, financing strategy, whatever that might be, I mean, there are a lot of ways to go at it. There's the TIF bonds, there's the special purpose local option sales taxes. There are a whole bunch of things. You could probably build some things there uh, in terms of uh, policy uh, requirements. And then uh, if the transit agency uh, puts out an RFP, um, you might have requirements built into that RFP that would look at uh, making sure that a certain percentage is affordable and that type of thing. So there are a number of strategies and thoughts, but there's got to be an alignment of policies and long-term impact because you're right, if you, if you don't speak to it, it's not going to happen organically. So uh, some careful thought has to be put into it to make sure that you aren't displacing or not creating future opportunities for families at the various uh, income ranges. I would just add, um, you know, I briefly mentioned community land trusts, but that could also be a model in that sort of neighborhood that you're describing where, you know, the land is kept in trust and the inhabitants, they just lease the, the improvement, the structure. And then um, I think there's like a 99 year lease normally where once you sell, there's a covenant on the property, you can only uh, give back a certain percentage of the profit. The housing remains affordable, um, durably affordable long term. So. Um, that's something to explore if you haven't already been looking at that or enacting that in Nashville. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Hannah Cassidy. I'm with Reno and Kavanaugh. And um, uh, I, I just wanted to say something about the community land trust idea, because I think we're fortunate that we do have some fledgling experience with that here. And then I know that you all, I, I'm not sure if we're in about the same place in Atlanta and Nashville, or if you might be a little bit ahead of us. I know that you guys are also kind of in a fledgling state there. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I guess I'm curious, what would you say are the three major obstacles you've encountered to building that um, approach? And then is there some kind of uh, inspiration that's hit? To, to move past those things and really get things rolling. So I, I do not have experience with, and, and I think you're, it's accurate to say we're in a fledgling stage in Atlanta. Um, I would point you to Florida, which is well ahead of the rest of us in the South on this. Um, they have the Florida Community Land Trust Institutes, and they have a ton of resources on their website through the Florida, Florida Housing Coalition website. Um, I mean, there's a 100-page report. Uh, there are folks there, Bright Community Trust. They, they've done a wonderful job statewide. Um, Grounded Solutions Network. So I can point you to the people who know, you know those details, but personally, um, unfortunately, I don't have the personal experience. Nothing to add. Hi everybody. I'm um, I'm Elham Daha from uh, with Metro Planning Development Department. And my question is that if you have any experience with uh, some communities that become isolated around this uh, new, I mean, affordable housing development, and if you have this experience, uh, how you solved it, uh, and and on the other hand, do you have any program for them, for those neighbors that they don't want to develop and they just want to keep uh, the character of their neighborhood, and how uh, do you have any program to help them to rehabilitate their um, parts of, I mean, the place that they are living, or no, it's just for new development. Thank you. Well, just a couple of thoughts. When you're doing the uh, community engagement uh, piece, you have to go beyond just the footprint because you are having impacts around the larger uh, neighborhood. And I think that um, the most successful um, revitalization strategies is where everybody's the winner. And so the question is, uh, what that might look like. Uh, so for example, in several uh, neighborhoods where we were working, 
some of the elderly families needed to have some renovations made at their homes so that they could continue to afford to live there. So, I mean, there, you really have to get on the ground and understand what's happening in that surrounding neighborhood and uh, then work with the uh, you know, city council. In, in Atlanta, we have, uh, have what we call neighborhood planning units uh, because the impact is going to be greater than just that footprint and how you can uh, work so that families can continue to stay in the home and be uh, helped. And we were very successful in uh, using uh, TIF financing by creating other uh, community benefits that would uh, go just beyond that, uh, the, the footprint itself. So it's one of those on the ground uh, situational problem solving issues, but every, everybody wants something better uh, and typically the resistance comes based on the fear of being displaced or not being able to um, hold up their end of the bargain, just, just a whole host of issues. I'll just add one thing from um, previously I did a lot of work on emergency management and I think you're talking about the same populations that we struggled with that were hard to reach and um, you know to bring it into the planning process um, for, for safety reasons and you know we found that informal social networks um, worked really well to, to reach them and and one way that's not informal but um, at least in a lot of the populations and in, in many parts in the southeast is the faith-based communities so um, approaching them, hearing, you know, having them as a, at the table to talk about community needs and concerns, um, I think shouldn't be overlooked, those kinds of organizations. Okay. Matt, you had a question? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Carpenter and Ms. Glove, for being here. Uh, if we were in church, I would have added an amen to your comments that housing policy is transit policy, housing policy is education policy, housing policy is healthcare policy. So since I was too chicken to do it then, I'll say amen now to that. And thank you for, uh, for that point of emphasis. Um, my question actually is from Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, can, do, we, do you have any existing policies to encourage mixed income development today that are in place today that developers can take advantage of? And if so, can you talk in some specifics about that that people should be taking advantage of? Yes, Matt, we do. <laughs> um, there, um, the inclusionary housing policy was adopted in September of last year and is now effective. Um, and it basically says if you're increasing your residential um, entitlements, that we have incentives that are available to you to make you whole. So if you um, had residential entitlements, you've gotten your zoning, there are dollars in the housing incentives pilot program that's available, there's an application available online, where we will pay you the difference between your market rate and your below market rate units. Um, and so all it is is a grant agreement that goes before Metro Council and gets approved, and we're happy to have incentive programs like that that actually allows for the developer to do market rate as well as affordable and workforce housing. We do have a handout, handout that I hope you all have um, that has some of the tools. The Housing Incentives Pilot Program is the incentives program that is also attached to the um, inclusionary housing policy. My contact information is on there and our um, website is also on that handout so that you can go there, you can take a look at some of the requirements and the policies and procedures. But that is a tool that we have that's readily available right now. Contact me, developers, um, who would like to create mixed income communities. Thanks, Matt. Honestly, we should have had Matt moderate this thing. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Berkeley. Um, follow up to that question, we often are approached, thank you, I'm a council member, we're often approached by developers who um, are seeking in entitlement increases and we will say, great, uh, can we get some mixed income? And they will say, well, my, um, my equity partner needs a certain return on investment and I can't make the numbers work and my lender is really nervous about this and so I can't get my loan. So my question is, can the Federal Reserve help with either or both of those two stumbling blocks? 
So the short answer is no. Um, that is, well, not directly. Um, you know, this is the, the best role you can play is to kind of either be a part of a convening or bring together the partners who can start those discussions. Um, but yeah, we can't we can't move the needle on that um, from where we sit at the Federal Reserve. Um, but hopefully, you know, you have I think some developers in the room, and I think it's good for you both to hear from one another and you know other things that we've heard um, in Atlanta talking to private developers um, are things like it's even very difficult to market these um, affordable units that's not part of their you know business model and how do they how do they fill them? They often are filling them with people who meet the requirements by you know but not the spirit of kind of what the, the units are for. So there's a lot of challenges and I think just coming together and um, learning from one another is, is step one. I mean, to that end, though, are there some some lenders or developers that you all have seen be successful with it that if we wanted to get names and contact information, we could put people in touch? Is that a possibility? We can talk about that offline, I think. Sure. <laughs> all right. Yes. Uh, Scott Black with the Fernland Housing Authority and also uh, private developer of Western Development Group. So you mentioned earlier about expanding the LIHTC program. Thanks. You you'd mentioned earlier about expanding the LIHTC program and sort of as a spin to what Berkeley's saying, is there a possibility that the LIHTC program could expand? Right now it's currently targeted at 50% and 60% below median income or of median income. Could it go up to the 80%, which is really the target of workforce housing? Is that a possibility? Because that would be an answer to, uh, to Berkeley's question. Well, the answer is yes, it's possible. <laughs> the question is uh, getting the energy behind it. And there's this little thing called tax reform that's about to uh, kick off. And I think it's very important, uh, and I'm absolutely not speaking for the Federal Reserve at this point, but it's very important for the um, developers and for communities to get together and help educate your congressmen and congresswomen about the important uh, need for this tool. There are any number of proposals, bipartisan by the way, that we're advocating for an increase in the number of uh, low-income housing tax credits because it's really the only affordable equity uh, that helps uh, develop affordable units. But also, uh, one of the reforms was to uh, allow it to serve families up to 80% uh, of area median income. So I think it's about getting in touch with your, I, I suspect you have a coalition of uh, developers and folks that you work with your housing finance agency on and that type of thing, and, and come together and come up with some uh, proposals that will feed into that whole process. This clearly uh, tax reform is going to be uh, a very uh, interesting debate. and. Uh, well, what we don't want to do is uh, throw the baby out of the bathwater because there are a lot of issues that get touched um, by tax reform. Okay, we have time for one more question. John, I think you had one. Uh, yes, uh, John Markey. <laughs> With, um, I, I uh, am involved with the Active Transportation Working Group, and uh, I'm interested in whether large companies or organizations can partner with the city or with the federal government in some way to build workforce housing. I, uh, we conducted several surveys and found that uh, they're worried that their employees can't live anywhere near the office building. Is, are, are there any opportunities for partnership? I, I would hope so. I mean, that is something that we've, we've definitely talked to, not the companies themselves, but local governments about, and everyone feels like that is an untapped you know, opportunity. But I don't necessarily have good examples of where that's been implemented. Um, you know, I think there's rumblings about Amazon doing some things, especially with the homelessness population, but um, there's also a lot of other challenges uh, with, with um, their impact on Seattle and um, you know, property values and things of that nature. 
Um, but yes, I mean, I completely agree with you. I think that the business community uh, needs to be engaged, and if there are programs that could be designed to, to bring them in and to um, have have some skin in the game from them, that would be fantastic. Do you know any examples? Yeah, well, what, what I would say is that you know there are RFPs uh, led by various levels of government to do things, uh, and I think they're. Uh, a ways to get into the game. Clearly, every economic development arm at the local, state, and federal level are interested in this issue. I mean, the great news is that there is a lot of energy behind this issue because every major city in America, every single one of them, has this issue, and many of the rural areas as well, because Again, going back to the income conversation and the, the disconnect between the increase in the cost of goods and services versus wages, it's a real issue. And so uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities, and I think the Amazon example is a, a great one. I think the reason why they're doing, as they call it, headquarters too, uh, and they're you know doing the beauty contest, is, uh, they just can't afford to stay in that market. And so a city like Nashville, and I think there's some top five, Atlanta's in the hunt um, for you know this opportunity. And I think there are going to be more of those, quite frankly, because I know in some high-cost cities, uh, the workers just can't live. They can't afford to live there. And this uh, challenge of uh, people having to live far away from their workplace uh, has a lot of quality of life uh, implications. And so I think more and more affordable housing is going to be um, a competitive advantage if you're looking uh, to attract uh, new industry, new companies uh, to, to, to the area. So I think that's a good thing. And I think it's just you know networking and finding out where you can have the biggest and best impact. I'm going to hand it over to Adrian. Let's thank Renee and Anne for <laughs> I want to thank you, Jennifer, for um, facilitating the conversation. I think this has been great. This is definitely the start. I think we're all, this has piqued our interest, and hopefully we'll continue to have this discussion. I want to just say thank you, too, to Baker Donaldson for hosting us today. Um, we're very excited about our partnerships um, with private and public um, entities. And also, we want to say thank you to ULI Nashville, um, as well as the Metro Nashville Network for being here and recording this. Again, if any of your colleagues would like to view this, it will be on YouTube, um, and you can Google Metro Nashville Network to um, see the video. Um, just a couple of things. The Revised Housing Nashville Report will be available online next week. We, Over the summer, we met with several different groups, and we've revised some of the comments. Um, and so we will have a revised document on our website. Um, I mentioned the handout of some of the tools that we're currently working on in our office now. It's available at the table if you didn't already get, get those. There, there are plenty out there, and we welcome the conversation. So developers, if you're in the room and you want to know how to do mixed income develop, development, we can start the conversation, and if we need to get others in the room, um, we certainly can to help us make sure that you can get it done. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say that um, there are there were some financial institutions in here and some funders in here. I think it's critical that we have them in, the, in this discussion today um, because I think they now know that Nashville is going to be focused on mixed income communities. So just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, take a little time and make sure you know most of the folks in the room. And we look forward to seeing you again in some other format. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.